Hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and I'm absolutely delighted to have Mark O'Donnell with me again today. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for agreeing to, uh, to do this interview with me today. Yeah, it's great to see you, Steve. It's uh, been a few months since we've done, seems like forever, since we've done a little interview. And um, so thanks for having me on. I want to say congrats, by the way, since uh, I know your books, your new book is out, and it's been out for a few months. So I want to say uh, congrats on that. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, controversial, but uh, we knew that when we, when we did it. I just want to tell my listeners who may not have heard our previous interview or may not know that you are the famous John Redwood, uh, who was <laughs> undercover in the Watchtower organization, uh, really wanting to understand what was going on. And as you learn more and more, uh, have really delved deep into understanding the whole issue of abuse of power and uh, manipulation of minds and have been very involved with sharing information critical for uh, people to understand the internal workings of the Jehovah's Witnesses and such. You were born in the group and you just, you're an expert. So, um, and a lot of important um, developments have been happening in the legal situation, uh, media things that have come out. So that's why I was like, Mark, please talk with me again. So tell yeah, us what we need to know, Mark. There's please. so much going on. And, and, uh, and I love what you said about uh, being an undercover uh, person under John Redwood. That's an interesting thought because it just occurred to me that, uh, you know, I was undercover after leaving the witnesses. And when I say undercover, uh, in the sense that I had to use an alias in order to not have this uh, organizational religious, uh, you know, a governance of the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, come after me, disfellowship me, cause my family members not to speak to me, uh, just because I became a whistleblower and investigating child sexual abuse mishandling within the church. So, you know, you hear about people going undercover, you know, uh, as maybe active Scientologists or Mormons or what have you. A lot of times witnesses kind of do that after they leave the religion. Right. Good point. But you, hmm. yeah, because of the uh, intense shunning practices, excommunication practices, and because you were really wanting uh, members of the Jehovah's Witnesses to to hear about you and such and make up their own minds. I think that it was the wise thing to use an alias. But yeah, it definitely served my purpose. And, you know, I was always in fear of retaliation because I still had witnesses working for me uh, up until five or six years ago around the time I left the religion. Uh -huh. So, uh, you know, there was a direct impact. I, I could not do work outside of the Jehovah's Witness. Uh, in other words, I couldn't be an apostate or a whistleblower of the religion. That's their word and, for ex-members, apostates. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that's probably the most serious offense as a Jehovah's Witness, uh, you know, far worse than murder, adultery, fornication, those things you can easily come back from and rejoin the religion, I including being a child abuser. Uh, but an apostate, uh, that's something that almost <laughs> no witness has ever come back from. It's, it's a... Uh, a line that you cross that, you know, there's a, there's a point of no return there. Well, point of no return. And I just want to comment, if I can, that when I was deprogrammed from the Moonies and I learned about Chinese communist brainwashing and the eight criteria of, of Robert J. Lifton, the last one is called dispensing of existence. If you're in the group, you have a right to exist. <laughs> and if you leave the group or question it, you're no longer uh, worthy of rights and you're no longer worthy of, uh, of status. So you become a non person. And it's so, you know, you just said it so clearly that uh, demonstrated, in my opinion, you know, the mind control aspect of the Watchtower group. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, in, in the case of myself and so many others who've been disfellowshipped from the religion, um, they flip the script. So instead of me being a whistleblower doing things for right and moral and just reasons, what they did to me and others is they sent certified letters to our home accusing my wife and me of, of causing divisions. In fact, capital C, capital D, 
causing <laughs> divisions. So what that does is it, it implants in the minds of other witnesses that we've done something terribly wrong. We've tried to divide their faith, divide their congregation. And so instead of it being a good thing that we're investigating these uh, practices within the church, they flipped the script, called us the evildoers, and disfellowshipped us and used that and weaponized it against yep. us. Yeah, that's classic cult mind control strategy of projecting what they're doing onto everybody else. And I, I, I just want to share quickly uh, that came to my mind as you were describing that, that when I left the moon cult, I organized a group of ex-members. We first called ourselves ex-members against moon. And then I, I formed a, a company called X moon Inc and actually incorporated it initially as a nonprofit. And I got word that Moon heard about this and he, he called me the negative messiah <laughs> and that I was leading people straight to hell. <laughs> so, you know, now, now I'm the negative messiah leading people to hell instead of being the whistleblower who's like, this man's crazy, he's a malignant narcissist who wants to take over the world and take away everyone's religious freedom, right? Yeah, and I, and I think everything from, from reading your books, everything that you've done was out of proper motive. When, when you joined the, the Cult of Moon, you know, you were very idealistic, and, you know, you were in the college atmosphere, and I believe you, you actually gave up your college education yeah. uh, to join the church. And in fact, you came right here to Baltimore, Maryland, as I recall. To uh, Yeah, I was a fundraising team captain. That's where I fell asleep at the wheel and <laughs> almost died on the Baltimore Beltway. But I want to come back yeah. to Watchtower and, 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 and tap your, your knowledge, because you are, you've been immersed in studying, go, going to Montana, I know you went out there for the original trial. Why don't you fill mm -hmm. us in on some of the more important? Sure, developments. sure. Yeah, I actually went to Montana twice. First for the uh, 2018 trial, uh, which was a trial in which um, there were uh, three victims of a man by the name of Maximo Reyes, who has, by the way, since fled to Mexico with his wife. Um, so, you know, he sexually abused uh, his uh, step uh, children and his step granddaughter and uh, you know in a rather brutal fashion but the key to the case was the fact that the watchtower organization and the elders knew about what this man was doing they actually only disfellowshipped him after he confessed to abusing one of the children and they immediately reinstated him within a year just over a year but he was sexually molesting his step granddaughter both before during and after the time that he was disfellowshipped as a Jehovah's Witness. So one of the things, one of the points made at the original trial was that here's a man who was sitting in the audience of this Thompson Falls, Montana church meeting, uh, congregation meeting. And, you know, he was being treated as a brother, uh, reinstated to the congregation. Uh, these elders looked out upon the audience and they saw Maximo Reyes, they saw his victim sitting out there fully knowing what he was capable of. And in fact, he was molesting her at that time. So there's, uh, you know, they were held accountable not only for negligence, but for malice. And the judge uh, upheld that ruling. You know, first there was a, a ruling that Watchtower had violated Ma Montana's statute, which says you must report child abuse. If, mm -hmm. if you're a clergy member, you must report it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the judge upheld it. The jury upheld it. There was a $35 million judgment. But what Watchtower got away with on appeal the following year was they took it to the Montana Supreme Court and appealed that they had the right not to report because of a loophole in the law. And that loophole is basically, yes, you must report child abuse as a clergy member, but they have this clergy penitent confidentiality exception. And what they're saying is, you, even though all of these elders knew about the abuse, all of the uh, service department elders in New York knew about it, no matter how many people knew about it, as long as they consider it confidential, if the church defines it as confidential, then they're able to use that confidentiality exception 
And the Supreme Court felt that they had no choice but to rule in favor of it because the issue is that they're afraid of breaking uh, the First Amendment and the Establishment Clause. That's where they won on appeal. However, the big news this month is that the case has been refiled in the same Sanders County Court in Montana. And it's a little complicated. I won't get into too much of it because we don't have a lot of time. But the short end is they've refiled it on the basis of they're going back in time to the point where they never really got a chance to fully adjudicate the negligence issue because the judge had already ruled before the trial began that Watchtower was negligent in telling those elders not to report. So as a result, they didn't have to really argue the negligence aspect as much because the judge had already ruled on it. So right. now they're going back in that point of time where they can re-adjudicate. They've also added Watchtower Pennsylvania as a defendant. And that is significant because Watchtower uh, New York, the property holding billion dollar empire, multi-billion dollar empire, they were one of the prime defendants in that case, but they did not want to allow Watchtower Pennsylvania to be a defendant. And Watchtower Pennsylvania basically said, look, you know, we, we're just the copyright holders. We're, we're just the, the, the people who print the Watchtower. Here's, here's an old one from 1950. Uh, and they said, you know, we have no involvement in child abuse. Well, documents have turned up that show that Watchtower Pennsylvania indeed does have partial responsibility in discussing, managing, and otherwise handling uh, child abuse cases. And we have, we have documents. I won't get into it too much. But so that's, I wanna, I wanna that's one of the I reasons wanna... they're being held accountable and the case has been refiled in Montana. Yeah, so I guess I want to just, because I, and, and we don't have a lot of time, but I, I guess I want to just comment that it seems to me like the Catholic Church uh, sexual abuse cases of all of those young people, um, they would have argued the same thing that we were priests, you know, or that we, you know, we had a re relationship of confession in the church. But I guess I'm, I'm wondering if there, if there was any case law about the Catholic church that can be used in the watchtower legal cases, or it's a, a different, different system. Well, you know, that's, that's very interesting that you bring up the Catholic Church. Um, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses are even far more hierarchical than the, uh, than the Catholic Church. Now, we know the Catholic Church has the Pope, and then you have various uh, cardinals and bishops and dioceses of various, you know, right. states. Like Pennsylvania has, I think, eight different major dioceses. Um, but what's interesting about the Jehovah's Witnesses is that they have this central governing authority, uh, which is far more in control of their members' activities than the Catholic Church is. So, so the Catholic Church can respond to these child abuse allegations sort of in their own jurisdictions separately. And uh, many of them, like the Archdiocese of Baltimore, have issued apologies uh, in fact, they've put it on their website that th they have apologized. They've uh, now what they did was very, very wrong. They know it. But if you look up the Archdiocese of Baltimore, for example, they've got a long apology on there that says we're willing to help victims. And, um, and look, some people will argue against that and say, well, they're just trying to pay out the minimum amount of money, make a token apology. But it's far more than what Jehovah's Witnesses have done. Sure. Sure. So what, one of the arguments that's made with the Jehovah's Witnesses is that th they say, when they go to court, they say, hey, you cannot hold this confidentiality um, rule to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, so I'll give you an example. So within the Jehovah's Witness Church, you have multiple elders. It's not just one priest. It's not just one elder. Right. You'll have 8, 10, 12, sometimes 15 or 20 elders in a large congregation. So what the Jehovah's Witnesses are saying is, hey, you can't hold our religion to the standards uh, that you're holding the Catholic Church. In the Catholic Church, you have this priest-penitent confidentiality where they say whatever a person confesses to a priest, that's confidential, and they don't have to disclose that to the police or anyone else. With Jehovah's Witnesses, what they're claiming is, hey, you can't tell us that we can't tell all of our elders about this child abuser and all of our service department New York elders, you can't tell us that because you're violating the establishment clause, which says that you, know, you can't 
among other things, it says you can't favor one religion over another. I get it. Yeah, that is really different. And I also, I guess I want to add a very bizarre teaching of the Watchtower that says you need two witnesses to, to a crime, uh, especially of, of child sexual abuse. And I watched the first half of the Oxygen special, which featured two women who right. had been abused by the same guy. They really did a, a, an in-depth job of explaining um, you know, the, how, how they, were, they were blamed, they were minimized, they were ignored, the survivors, and, and how destructive the entire system within the, within the watchtower you know, really is. Yeah. And, and that two witness rule applies to their own internal justice system. It doesn't apply to reporting to the police. So right. what you've got there is a situation where Debbie McDaniel obviously was a, a victim of abuse and was just suffering because, you know, the elders basically threw their hands up and said, you know, nothing we can do unless he confesses. And, and ultimately he did confess. And, um, but, really the uh the situation didn't get far worse until a, a second person came forward dolores and uh you know i have to say uh in fact you may want to comment on this so in in the documentary i'm not sure if this was part two that you haven't seen yet but there i was haven't a, seen part two yet yeah yeah i'm not sure if this was part two i have to go back to my notes it was but, the first hour and a half that i watched that was, well what they did was they sat down so uh the victims uh survivors debbie yes. uh, and dolores were sitting at a table with trey bundy the journalist and also their local uh, attorney mm -hmm. so the four of them were having a discussion and trey bundy said that there was a database you know and he asked some you know question about the database and the one woman dolores uh, she stopped and said can we stop now and she was crying well this was a very authentic moment where that woman, Dolores, for the first time, and it happened on camera, was, was told that there was a secret database of child abusers that the religion was harboring. So I bring this up to you, Steve, because I'd like you know, your input on this, because that to me says just how divided the uh, churchgoers, the congregants are, from you know the upper echelons of the religious hierarchy, you know the governing body and the branch committee members and all of these people, the fact that a congregant simply doesn't know that they're maintaining all of these personal records of of child abusers, and this poor woman was breaking down in tears, and they had to bring her tissues. But I think that maybe is something that you've seen in other groups where they don't realize what's going on at the top. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to take the liberty of grabbing a. A, a graphic that I have in my book, Combating Cult Mind Control. Most people are at the base. There are some fringe members. Maybe they haven't been baptized yet, but they go to meetings or whatever. But people down here don't know what's going on up here or up here or in the governing body. And um, I, I've seen this phenomenon so many times with so many different cult groups where um, the, the survivor has been living under this hell, feeling like it's their fault, like it's only them. And then in watching that show, for this woman to realize it's not just me, there are all these other victims. They have a list of predators. Are you kidding me? I feel yeah. so stupid. I think she even said, I feel stupid, which make, breaks my heart as a therapist. Because if she understands cult mind control, she needs to understand it's not about her. It's about the predatory organization that's using control of behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions to control people, to make them subservient and obedient. So that might be a good segue to ask you, Steve, that uh, for those who are perhaps uh, survivors of child sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witness or, or really any religion, um, that want help, maybe they can't afford, um, you know, full-time counseling or they, uh, you know, what, what are some of the steps that they can take to perhaps reach out to your foundation or your organization to get some help, whether it's through the books or your website, Freedom of Mind? What are some of those steps? Yeah, so exactly. Um, 
I've, I've written books. They're in libraries. You can get them for free if you can't afford to buy a book. Um, uh, I have over 200 free videos. I've been doing blogs on, on uh, a whole variety of different subjects. Um, I do a certain number of pro bono cases, and we're looking at trying to do some type of group process thing online that people can afford where they can ask me questions and I can give them answers. But it really comes down to you can do a lot by learning and reading books. And I, I first uh, got a, a myself uh, educated about the Watchtower as a destructive cult in 1989 when a former elder, Randall Waters, e you know, uh, actually it wasn't an email, it was a letter, this was way before uh, the internet. And he said, how come you didn't write about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Right. And I said, why? And he said, because I underlined the whole book. It's every, <laughs> I, you know, I now I get it. It's a cult. I knew the Moonies were a cult, but now I really get it. And I said, teach me. And he, he said, come to LA, I'll organize a group of ex members and we'll teach you. So I've been learning ever since and helping people ever since. And it, it breaks my heart to hear about people who've left years ago and they still don't get what cult mind control is about and the healing strategies uh, that can help people get better. And that said, I want to say there are other former cult members who've left different cults who've become mental health professionals, and they, they're helping as well. And then there are group workshops that are getting organized as well by different organizations. Check them out. And I want to say, you know, Mark, you and, and your wife, Kimmy, have been helping people uh, tremendously. Uh, there, there are groups online and Facebook groups and Reddit groups. So if, if you are isolated, definitely seek out uh, you, Mark, uh, Freedom of Mind. Uh, check out, uh, and, you know, the work. Yeah, and thank you for making yourself available to former witnesses. I, I know how important your work has been, especially the bite model and just you know, it's so simple for people to understand that an organization can control your behavior, can control your thoughts, your emotions, you know, everything, um, you know, your information stream. Uh, yeah, and if a, people can so afford simple. to hire me, I would love to work with them or advise them on how to help a loved one get out of a cult, obviously. Um, some people have more resources than others, and it's how I fund my activism work is, is through do the con consulting yeah. but let's dive back to what's going on as you see it uh i'd like you to explain about um marcy hamilton the the ruling in new york where people who've been abused in the watchtower around the around the country and maybe around the world can sue the watchtower in new york state Right. So, uh, yeah, we've talked a little bit about that, I think, maybe on one of our last uh, interviews we did. And we're halfway into that New York Child Victims Act. And you mentioned Marcy Hamilton. So uh, she's done incredible work. Uh, you know, she's the CEO of Child uh, USA and um, dot org uh, dot org, a For professor. Check yeah, it out. she's got a great social media presence. And, uh, you know, she was very involved in that Child Victims Act of New York. She was there with the governor when that was signed uh, into, I think it was about a year ago, they signed it into law. And then August 14th, it went active. It's active for a year. And what that basically means is that there's a one year window to justice where they've thrown out all of the previous statute of limitations where people were barred from filing their civil cases against their abusers or against an organization who may have covered up their child abuse. And in the case of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the, the theory behind using this new law is that they are headquartered in New York and they sent out instructions to all of these congregations and told these elders in various states not to report. And, and that applies to, for example, the, the Debbie McDaniel case. She was featured in the Oxygen documentary. So Previously, she was barred in her home state. Now she's able to file a case. Now, I want to say we don't know what the outcome is going to be. It has to be filed. The court right. has to accept it. It may take a couple of years to adjudicate. But uh, not only victims in New York, but obviously victims in all 50 states have the possible opportunity to file their cases if there's enough evidence. 
and if the court accepts it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, special shout out to Marcy for her work. I think she's written a book called God versus the gavel. It's a, it's a great right. book. It's excellent. And it, and it basically, you know, argues my point of view that any legitimate religion respects people's freedom of mind, gives informed consent, you know, and freedom of religion includes freedom to leave any particular re religion and not be coerced or threaten that everyone in your life will cut off contact with you is another big problem. Um, so for her, the law needs to get you know, more enlightened about the whole issue of undue influence and mind control and not give a, because some group says I have an IRS tax exemption, we have the right to violate people's you know, civil liberties and human rights. So, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you was regarding, uh, we've got this Oxygen documentary, and of course, as uh, I'm sure you're well aware, whenever you're a, a member of a group uh, such as, you know, Scientology, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, whatever the case, uh, if it's a controversial group like that and a major network covers it, such as the Oxygen Network has a four-hour documentary, and then we've got major media, we've got People Magazine here. Uh, this is a very recent issue. And uh, let's see, here we go. Jehovah's Witness cover-up. Now, you know, my question to you is when, when you see this uh, as a former cult member and you've got all of this programming and we know the Jehovah's Witness uh, governing body has said these are all apostate-driven lies, you know, dishonesties. They've done this as a matter of damage control. Um, you know, my question is, you know, in your mind, how do active Jehovah's Witnesses rationalize all of this negative media attention, uh, which we know is factual, and how do they are, are able to rationalize that in their minds with the fact that, you know, they're, they're trying to be loyal, devoted followers, but their governing body members are telling them to turn off the TV whenever they see these reports. Right. So, I mean, it's classic. And it, it, same thing with the Moon cult. My father found out Moon had an M16 gun factory. <laughs> he read an article in the paper, told me about it. I talked to my leaders. They said it was a lie. Mm. Don't believe it. And in the mindset of a Mooney, everything is Satan that is trying to raise doubts or is trying to criticize God's work on earth. So for me, it's not as much about rationalization, but it's more about understanding this notion of a dual identity, that you have an actual critical analytic mind and a conscience, and you have the cult programming that suppresses those parts of your psyche. But you feel it, and you know there's something wrong, and so there's a dissonance that's happening inside of people um, all the time. But it, 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 it really is about phobia programming, thought stopping, the loaded language. Um, but the good news is, is even with people born into cults, and I want to cite Michael Rinder, for example, who was in Scientology 46 years and was head of, of the Office of Special Affairs, which was like their Gestapo. And he's out talking critically of Scientology, trying to help people wake up and get out of Scientology. My point is, is that it's not permanent and that ultimately people do wake up and go, this is not, I, I want to believe, you know, Jehovah God is in Watchtower, but thing after thing after thing after thing, I just, it's not right. What, what I'm being told, the dissonance, I'm being told that my best friend or my sister or my brother or my mother or my father are now evil because they're apostates. It just doesn't add up. Yeah. And uh, we can add to that some of the other events that are happening. Um, Please. On, so uh, one of the things, now we're, we've talked about the Oxygen Network documentary, which was very well produced by Trey Bundy and his team at uh, Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, some of the best reporting we've seen on Jehovah's Witnesses, but yet still the witnesses will say, well, that's apostate media that's controlled by Satan. And, uh, you know, we need to turn that off. But there's some things that are undeniable. And um, so over the weekend, uh, I released an article through JW Survey, 
and that was immediately followed by the USA Today and the Philadelphia Inquirer, uh, which covered the story of the Jehovah's Witnesses are under a grand jury investigation by the mm. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And um, so as it turns out, they, uh, this is the 45th investigating grand jury, and it's being handled by the same group of investigators and people from the attorney general's office who investigated the Catholic Church. Mm. Now, grand juries typically take 18 months, sometimes up to two years. Uh, they are really in, in a, a very powerful position of issuing subpoenas and search warrants and gathering information and you're in a room full of 23 grand jurors and about 12 or so alternates who are all taking notes, asking, right. asking questions. So back in the summer, um, I was subpoenaed to testify and ended up testifying in August and then later in December. So I can discuss my own personal testimony, but obviously the investigation is very uh, top secret. You know, it's, right, it's, secret. it's a, right. right. So um, I guess... Uh, my my commentary on that would be the fact that you've got Jehovah's Witnesses out there who at some point, there has to be a tipping point. Now, this is true, really, I, I guess, for any group or cult, but there's a tipping point where they say, wow, I, you know, we we could ignore what we saw in People magazine because, look, the, you know, there's false stories all the time. But when you have the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in a grand jury investigation into criminal conduct, you, you've got to think that some of the people in the organization, there's, there's got to be a tipping point for them where they say, well, that's enough to convince me that I'm in a group that may be harmful to myself, my family, or to children. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I, I want to, I guess I want to just comment for those people who are not familiar with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Like, it was a revelation for me of sort when I started studying the Jehovah's Witnesses in 1989 to realize the Bible that they were going door to door with was not the same Bible that Christians use, that they have, they have the New World Translation that every theologian, Christian or Jewish, says is not a good translation. There's so many inaccuracies. There's not even names of legitimate scholars who were involved with the translation. Just to realize the deception that they, that, that they think they're following the Bible, and they're not. It's not the same Bible that everyone so, else. Has. It's such a fundamental thing that people need to to realize. But coming back to you know strategy and everything else, to me, the legal system is slow. But ultimately, it's the leadership, the governing body, that needs to be held accountable. And in right. my opinion, they need to be served. They need to be you know uh, subpoenaed and deposed. And they need to, to realize the, the pain that they've been subjecting people to. And I remember Ray Franz in his book, Crisis of Conscience. He was born in the watchtower and was on the governing body. When he woke up and left, a lot of people woke up and left. So my hope is that some people, at least one at the top, will like get it, that they're part of a very sinister system this authoritarian mind control cult that isn't following the bible isn't following god and spiritual principles and and that they are responsible for harming uh, countless numbers of people so, that was really a yeah it's funny you bring up the new world translation because that really was a curveball that i was not expecting to discuss back in august during my first round of testifying for the grand jury that came up in and I was not expecting it. And unfortunately, I had the information to explain how that translation of the Bible came about. And one of the things that I think that the, you know, not naming any names, but people in that room were shocked to hear was the fact that this was a translation of the Bible produced by a man who had uh, less than two years study in Greek, which is not, an, not enough to be an expert, uh, you know, it's not a lifetime Bible scholar, um, but it was Frederick Franz, the mm -hmm. uncle of Ray Franz that you just mentioned. Uh -huh. Frederick Franz was the one who had uh, two years study in Greek and no training in Hebrew. In fact, he ultimately had to admit that in open court in a case 
decades ago. Wow. So no Hebrew training, limited Greek training, and yet he was uh, known among the inner circle to have been the, the person who spearheaded the New World Translation, which was released in 1950. Right. And, and, you know, I, I didn't realize that uh, because the government's very concerned with not stepping on religious beliefs, and they have to be. That's why we have the Establishment Clause. But they did find it of interest, the fact that this religion has produced their own uh, translation of the Bible that uh, it really has guided the beliefs of Jehovah's Witnesses um, in particular since they released it in 1950. And I think that has been sort of a rallying point for Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and a few years ago, uh, maybe it was 2013 or so, they mm -hmm. released an updated version of the New World Translation. Yeah, but I, I, I would argue that it's, it, it's, it's a document where people are lying. I mean, they've been lied to, so they're just repeating the lie to newcomers who want to study the Bible without explaining there's no legitimate Bible scholar that thinks this is legitimate. Um, and no one would join a group thinking they're following God if the Bible that they're studying is not, you know, considered to be a, a, a legitimate document. So for me, it's like a, a, on, on, a, on a secular level, you know, going to a, a used car dealership and being told that the car has 30,000 miles and it's got 130,000 miles. And where's the consumer protection to say, you know what? you can't go around door to door saying you're studying the Bible when you're not studying the Bible. You're studying a concocted version of the Bible that nobody thinks is legitimate except the people in your pyramid-structured authoritarian group. Well, I think that's where your research into information control is so critical because for, for every quote that you just said where scholars said that this is not a superior translation, Jehovah's Witnesses quote mine all of the uh, those critics, or they quote mine little snippets from people who say, oh, it's a wonderful, clear, easy to understand translation. And they insert those into Watchtower literature to the point where because witnesses are only uh, able to read, you know, the Watchtower magazine, then they are only exposed to the positive statements about the New World Translation there might be one positive for every 500 negative, and yet they only see that one thing. And that's, yeah, and that's information. called information control, and that's part of the mind control uh, structure that I argue is undermining freedom of religion. I believe in God. I want people to have faith and pray and, and be part of a community that's spiritual. Great. But... You need to have freedom of mind to ask questions, to challenge beliefs, to research outside of the organization, to get other points of view in order to have that religious freedom. And people in mind control cults, they're operating out of fear and guilt and threats, threats of being cut off, threats of being excommunicated, you know, et cetera. And, and the last days, you know, little children are being shown these upsetting apocalyptic images. Yeah, Armageddon. You know, at any moment, the world's coming to an end. So, you, you know, you don't, don't relate to anything in the world. You don't need to go to school because the world's ending. You don't need to plant crops because the world is ending. How many, how many times have they predicted the end of the world and it hasn't come true? Yeah, I featured that as a, a part of my JW survey story on the grand jury because I, I wanted to explain to people how I came about leaving the religion mm -hmm. and how even as a child, I was aware something was not right in the covering up of, of uh, child abuse or sexual assault, things that I saw and reported to the elders and nothing happened to it. You know, so I um, I mention these things, you know, to kind of get to the point where this is why my conscience told me I've got to get out and I've got to lead because it's it's not a healthy. But I want to I want to do a shout out for you and and your wife Kimmy that you are you know one of those rare courageous people that doesn't just get out, but they're like, no, I want to help other people. 
I want to help my family. I want to help my friends. Everyone needs to know this so they don't have to experience the pain and the suffering and the anguish and the threats that, that you know yeah. so directly because you yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you for that. And it, it does mean a lot to us that we're able to do this work because to be honest, it's not for everyone. And, uh, you know, so many of my friends that left years ago or even recently have just moved on with their lives. And, and I am so happy for them that they don't have to deal with this aside from the shunning, which look, you know, many have gone on with their lives, but there is this ever present uh, something that you cannot ignore. And that is the fact that their family won't talk to them anymore. And despite them moving on with their lives, you know, that never goes away and you can't erase the fact that we were all part of this uh, cult. Yeah. And, and I guess I want to do a shout out for our next member, Cliff Henderson. Uh, Kimmy shared this most incredible music video that he did about being shunned. Uh, cost of doing business. Cost of doing business. We'll include a link to that in our blog. Great. Because it, it made me cry. It was just so moving and so powerful and so completely accurate. Yeah, I had a chance to uh, spend a lot of time with Cliff in, in Australia, actually, back in uh, June in the summer. And he played me that song before he got professionally produced. And I just said, this is brilliant. You know, he's yeah, a very he's humble guy. Brilliant. I'm going to let you go in a minute, but you just mentioned Australia. And I just want you to comment on the Australian Commission uh, and what they found. Yeah, so uh, back in 2015, the Australian Royal Commission, it was a commission uh, that was uh, brought together to investigate allegations of childhood sexual abuse and, and the handling of those allegations in all groups. It wasn't just Jehovah's Witnesses. It was the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, the YMCA, all of these groups. Right. So it, the, the subtitle was Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. So when they got to the Jehovah's Witnesses, what they found was that they were the most uncooperative of all the groups. Now, they did turn over their documents. They were forced to by order of law. When they turned over their sexual abuse documents that went back 60 years, they found that there were 1,006 cases of pedophiles or child abusers and almost 1,900 victims of those uh, 1, that they knew cases about. that they knew about, right? These are just the ones reported as confirmed right. cases reported to the Watchtower. Right. Because as you know, many are never reported. Most are French not reported. Most are not reported. Right. And what they found when they investigated those cases is that not one single case had been reported by church elders to law enforcement, not one. Now, the parents or relative or since in a few cases, the victims ultimately reported of many of these cases, but the elders never did. So that was a commission um, that was very serious. And two years later, in 2017, they issued a final report and they issued recommendations. Uh, they also said that we recommend that all organizations that have a problem with child sexual abuse participate uh, in a redress scheme. And the redress scheme means, look, provide a fund. Watch is a multi-billion dollar corporation. Provide a fund to help these victims of child sexual abuse. And, uh, you know, a, lot, a get great deal. Yes, to get therapy, whatever they need. Mm -hmm. And many of the organizations cooperated and said, yes, we will participate. Watchtower and Jehovah's Witnesses, no, they won't participate. And it remains to be seen whether or not they'll be held accountable for participating in this. But if nothing else, it's a great deal of negative press uh, for them. It's a great risk that they're taking in saying we don't need to, uh, we're not responsible. Because to say that would be to admit guilt. Right. And they don't want to admit guilt. They say we handle everything correctly. We don't break the law. And, you know, uh, Steve, the thing is, um, in a lot of these court cases, and, and this is going back to Montana, will be my last point on Montana, and we'll wrap it up. But look, uh, Montana, one of the issues is negligence that never got properly adjudicated. And when I talked to the attorneys, attorneys involved, uh, one of the things they said was that, look, you know, you can 
the courts can say that technically a person is not negligent because technically they didn't break the law. So the Supreme Court said, well, you got away on the technicality because of this clergy penitent loophole exception. But the argument that's being made is that the negligence, just because you didn't have the uh, legal obligation to report, doesn't mean you were not negligent. So that is one of the arguments, arguments you're making. So it, it would be like if you're walking down the street, you know, and a little old lady's getting mugged. Uh, you know, there are laws in some states that require, you know, citizens to intervene. Uh, you know, if somebody's being attacked, you can't <laughs> remind me of the police, right? Inter it reminds me of the famous Seinfeld episode, you know, when they ended the, the series of Seinfeld, you know, and they watch this uh, crime taking place and they're all just standing around, you know, looking at it and they end up getting thrown in jail because they were negligent. And I know that's a comedy, but it's very real to hmm. say that even if you're not breaking the law, you can still be held accountable legally for negligence. And that's where Jehovah's Witnesses are getting themselves in trouble. And that's why the case in Montana is being filed again, because they were negligent. And I want to add, this is about the failure to protect children. This is about failure to protect minors that the law realizes are susceptible to undue influence in particular because they are not adults etc. I want to just throw in this one point that came into my mind as you were talking, Mark, and that is just the, the craziness of a doomsday cult, which is what I think of the Watchtower, because the Armageddon, 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 of the leadership stockpiling billions of dollars for Armageddon. Like, excuse me? <laughs> Almighty Jehovah right. God is going to remake the entire world and people are going to live forever on planet Earth. But, you know, they, they need billions of dollars and they need to play these legal charades. It just, yeah. And they would argue that they're not stockpiling money, that they're using it to build a new facility where they're going to be producing videos in Ramapo, New York, and they're, and they're working on that now. And I mean, if they really believe that Armageddon was imminent and around the corner, I think they you know, wouldn't spend you know, hundreds of millions of dollars building the these studios, which they already have, by the way, they're already making. It's hard to believe it's going to cost a hundred million dollars to build a. a well, and, a and the studio. other thing is, yeah, and and how much of that money could be used to help the public? Because they are a five hundred one c three. Let's not forget the fact that these religions are tax exempt organizations that are just collecting billions of dollars. Watchtower's just got a stranglehold on their followers. They've got them donating on uh, automatic payment by credit card through their. Yeah system exploitation and not one penny goes to the public it only is used internally to help yeah. their members yeah and that is a concern to me because that means that they're really not a public benefit corporation yep and i i did put something in the last chapter of my latest book on how in my version of the real of the ideal world mark we would have a uh, an independent commission where people could make complaints against nonprofits, particularly religious groups. If they're violating the law, if they're violating civil rights, they should lose their tax exemption status. I agree. And, and I just want to thank you for all the work that you've done uh, with, uh, you know, your freedom of mind group and uh, your books. And uh, you, I, I know that, you know, you have an end goal here, and you're really trying to help change laws and make people aware of undue influence or whatever term is being yeah, used. Yeah, undue influence, coercive control, you know, brainwashing, thought reform. There's a lot of different terms, but they, we need to get away from the rational agent model of the 19th century that you turn 18 and all of a sudden you can make good decisions uh, on your own and ignoring social influence and social psychology, ignoring neuroscience that says the frontal cortex isn't even matured till you're 25. So I would like the legal system to like get into the 21st century and serve yeah. justice for the everybody. And that's really where the biggest growth within the Jehovah's Witness uh, 
group call uh, occurs is within that age group of the minors from 10 or 12 years of age getting baptized all the way up through turning 21. I was 16 years old. And, mm. you know, my mindset was that I thought I had all the answers. I'm reading my Watchtower materials. All of my friends and family were witnesses. So I'm listening to what they have to say, not the outside world, not the educational system, the media. And I was absolutely immature at that age. And I completely, completely agree that it's got to be at least 25 years of age before a person's prefrontal cortex stops developing in a way that, you know, but by that point, it was too late for me. I had already dedicated myself to this uh, religious organization. And once you do that, it's too late. Because yeah, you exactly. Come, you can get the you know, I heard, and lose I, everything. We're going to wrap up. And thanks for staying longer than we had planned. But I, I'm trying to remember who had the idea of saying that it should be mandatory education for all children to study all the world religions. Like when they're in middle school, like to understand it's not just one thing, but that there's been a whole history of religion and different types of religions and what they actually teach. Um, that to me sounded like a great idea. It's a terrific idea. And but what's interesting about the Jehovah's Witnesses is that they, they have a book called Mankind's Search for God, and it's their version of this is what all the religions are, and here's how they came about, and here's why they're all false. Oh, my goodness. You know, so it goes into all these Aztec religions and Catholic and various forms of Christianity. The Witnesses um, proclaim that all religion is false, all all religion except for except Jehovah's theirs. Witnesses, except right. theirs. <laughs> they call it Babylon the Great. They use a biblical term to say that they are the world empire of false religion. And that includes Christendom, which is their term for all Christian religions that do not practice true Christianity. Yeah, the ones that use the actual New Testament. <laughs> right. So, you know, Sorry they've got... for laughing. No, it's, it, it's true. And, and I think, of course, we, you know, we, we grew up in... Of course, in the United States, you know, we're in a predominantly Christian nation. But what if we grew up in, you know, in India or in China or elsewhere? It's I think it's sure. really sobering to understand that, you know, we're not alone in this world and that we need to really uh, fully embrace the cultures and practices and, and teachings of other faiths and uh, of other groups, because, it, you know, we're, we're seeing things through such tunnel vision Right. And then you have cults to come along and say, well, we, you know, we are. Yeah, they have the religion. one and only truth. And then I, this, I promise this is my last point. <laughs> if, if you're walking on the street and you see witnesses out, you know, with their, with their sign boards and everything, if you're a former cult member or you've read my book, so you understand the notion, go over and talk with them and actually be friendly with them, mm -hmm. ask them what they think about the Montana ruling. They may not even know what you're talking about. And then you can say, well, there was a $35 million judgment because of, 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 of keeping child abuse uh, private and you should do research on it. Um, or J mentioned jwsurvey.org. Um, Oh, you know what I mean? Just have conversations with these folks so that yeah, they don't respectful. just see you as an enemy or satanic, but just genuinely caring about them and, and, and letting them know that there is life after group. Yeah, I think they call that street epistemology. And uh, we've seen a lot of it, uh, you know, even be successful as long as it's handled respectfully. Exactly. Um, yeah. So respectful, yeah. asking questions and a curious thing, avoiding calling names, avoiding, you know, uh, talking down to people. And I, I always like to share my moon experience, even though I've been out for so many years, because uh, a lot of, of, of uh, cult members, you know, will say, oh, yeah, you were in a cult, Steve. And then I say, well, check it out, because there are these patterns of behavior control and information control, etc. So you plant the little seed. You don't know what's going to grow, but it, it is something worth doing if you have five minutes. You don't need to spend hours. Five minutes, warmth, make eye contact, ask their names, ask how long they've been in, and, and, and plant the seed. 
you just made me think of one more thing, Steve. Okay, I think, go uh, for it. Yeah, this was this was interesting. So I, I uh, had a newspaper article that was from a, the late 1960s, and they followed the Jehovah's Witnesses when uh, they had a big convention in Baltimore in 1966, I think it was. I've got a copy of the newspaper here. So the Baltimore Sun covered this, and they sent uh, a reporter to follow the Jehovah's Witnesses in their yep. ministry. And I think you know what I'm going to say. So, uh, so what happened was they knocked on some doors, and they got rejected here in Baltimore. And uh, so I've got a little snippet from that newspaper article about the, the Witnesses, and uh, so it says uh, her caller assured her that he was certain uh, she did know her faith and she wouldn't think of pulling, uh, he wouldn't think of pulling her away from it. So I'll stop there and say first, the Jehovah's Witnesses do that all the time. They go knocking on doors and they say, oh, we're not here to change your religion. That, that is what we were taught as uh, children going all the way up to adulthood. You don't tell people you're there to change their religion. So you tell them you're not. You tell them a lie, basically. You tell them a lie, exactly. Right. So the article goes on to say, it says, he left one of the witness publications free of charge and they parted pleasantly. And then it says, quote, this is the witness talking. You have to use a little psychology in this ministry all the times, all the time, Mr. James explained later. Quote, I had to convince that housewife, for example, that I wasn't really trying to sell her anything. So I gave her the magazine. So I found that fascinating that you've got a witness coming, uh, is revealing to the Baltimore Sun that they're using psychology and techniques in order to convince people they're not there to change their religion when in fact that's exactly... Yeah, the ends yeah. justify the means. That's the mindset of a cult member. Yeah, very powerful. And he believed it. So that's why he, he, he said something to the, to the media. He may have been chastised later by someone in the hierarchy. I don't know. I wonder. But, um, but it's, it is a good question, by the way, if anyone's approached by anyone trying to recruit them into anything. Are you trying to recruit me? And if they look you in the eye and say, not at all, I tell you, if you do go to any more meetings or whatever, at some point, if it is a cult, you will find out that that person had lied to you and that they are trying to recruit you. Yeah. And at the moment the light bulb goes on, get out. <laughs> like, don't do what I did. Get away. As soon as the light bulb turned on for me, I was in an isolated you know, compound in, in Tarrytown, New York, and it was freezing cold and I had no transportation or a phone but you know get away <laughs> yeah and i think that sh that shows the power of love bombing because you you know you had these uh, you know attractive girls that were talking to you at college yep. and then they said, oh we're you know we're now we're not in a cult we're just you know great yeah, we're not trying to brainwash you are you afraid we're trying to brainwash you how ridiculous you're a smart person mark you you would never allow anyone to brainwash you right <laughs> and then before you know it it's too late Right. So listen, my friend, thank you. Great work. Thank you for, for going over what our, our prearranged time is, but I feel like we covered a lot of great topics, continued success, and we'll do this again in the near future. Always a pleasure, Steve. Thanks for your work and uh, for having me on and look forward to doing it again. Yeah, great. Thanks. You're welcome. I'm